As those cold winter months continue to set in, I thought I'd send a few more strange and downright spooky wilderness stories your way. Over the last year, there's been a whole lot of folks contacting me about these strange experiences, and many of them seem to occur under the veil of a stormy winter night. So be sure to lock your doors, close the curtains, bundle up, and throw another log on the fire. Cause tonight, it's storytelling time. This first story comes to us from Colin in Ashland, Oregon. I live in a pretty remote area of Oregon, and about 20 miles east of Ashland, and in the heart of Cascade Country. I'm a jack-of-all-trades kind of guy, and out here, you take whatever work you can find. Well, I got lucky last winter, and was contracted to do a little plumbing work for a small U.S. Forest Service satellite office not far from town. A solid week's worth of work and good money. Well, it was near the end of that week when I had my experience. It was the night of January 15th of last year, and the darkness had already set in. I was one of about three people at the office, a park ranger, the receptionist, and myself, staying late to tie up some loose ends. I was working on repairing some damaged pipes that had frozen over and cracked, causing a large leak under the building. Most of the work had already been finished. Now I just needed to put the bathroom floor back together and in one piece. Well, about 7 o'clock rolls around and both the receptionist and park ranger are already gone at this point. I had about another hour or two before I felt comfortable enough to call it a day, but with the strong winter storm approaching, I wanted to be on the road and on my way home before conditions got too bad. About an hour goes by and I heard the first rush of wind battering the side of the building, followed by the pitter-patter of sleet on the tin roof. That was my signal to wrap things up and hit the road. So as I gathered up my tools that I had strewn all over the bathroom floor, I heard the front door swing open, followed by footsteps running on the hardwood floors. It kind of startled me, but I figured it was one of the staff returning to grab something they had forgotten that night. I looked out the bathroom window and toward the parking lot, which was dimly lit by the green glow of a flickering street lamp. Other than my utility truck, it was completely empty. Strange, nobody had pulled up. This got my attention, so I stood on up, grabbed a 60 inch straight iron pipe wrench, and poked my head out of the bathroom and into the hallway. From there, I had a partial view of the front office. I could see paperwork had blown all over the floor and I could hear the sleet forcing its way inside the front door. The footsteps had ceased at this point, so I called out, Hey, did you forget something? Hoping to hear a familiar voice respond, but there was no reply. Alright, so at this point I slowly and quietly crept down the hallway and into the front office. Papers were still flapping around in the wind, and as I gazed over to the front door, it slammed shut immediately. My attention was directed at the windows on each side of the door, but nobody had passed by them. Where the hell did they go, I thought. Was it the wind causing all this ruckus? I hurried over to the front door, opened it and peered out, scanning my surroundings. Again. There was nobody. As I began to pass it off as the storm, a loud boom came from the rear and the building shook. My natural reaction was to look back down the hallway and behind me to where the sound came from. It sounded like somebody had backed a truck into it. 
It was about that time I told myself to get the hell out of there and head for the truck. I couldn't stay in that office building any longer after that. The tools can wait, I told myself. So I beelined it from my truck, got in and slammed the door shut, locking it immediately. I fired up the engine and pulled around to the edge of the parking lot, aiming my high beams at the rear end of the building as I did so. But nothing. Nothing but the aggressive flurry of ice coming down outside. I was on the road seconds later. The next day, I went back and finished the project. I told the office staff what had happened the night before, but they passed it off as the storm since nothing was missing or damaged. I don't know how to explain my strange experience, but one thing's for sure. I won't be working by myself late at night at that office anymore. Our next story comes to us from Robert in Washington State. In late December 1999, my brother and I were traveling back to Washington from Portland after visiting family. We only had a few hundred miles left of the trip, but decided to make a pit stop along the way to stretch our legs and create a few memories. So we decided to stop at Mount Rainier for a little hike. It was late in the season, but despite the temperature being a bit cool, the weather was perfect for that time of year. My brother Scott and I had never been to Rainier before and were really looking forward to seeing some of her beauty. Nothing too strenuous, just a couple hours hike and we'd be on our way home again. We drove to the Longmire area parked the car and began our trek toward Mildred Point. There was some light patches of snow in certain areas, but otherwise it was a nice smooth hike and not a single cloud in the sky. To our surprise, we were the only ones out there. About 30 minutes up the trail, we found a log to sit on and take a little breather. From where we were, we could barely see the 14,000 foot mountain peak way off in the distance. We took in the view, grabbed a splash, and finished up before continuing on. A little further up, Scott stepped off the trail to relieve himself just a few feet away. But then he noticed something bizarre in a nearby tree. He called me over to check it out and what we saw kind of blew our minds. Dangling from the lower limbs of a Douglas fir tree were the tattered and torn remains of a dirty white t-shirt. My initial thoughts were that maybe somebody had decided to do their business there, but that theory was derailed when I continued looking up. There was a tan belt caught on another limb just several feet above the shirt. Well, that's not weird at all, I told Scott. He then directed my line of sight even further above it to an old pair of khaki pants about 25 feet up from the belt. We stood there for a moment, scratching our heads in confusion and continued scanning the tree in the nearby area. I began kicking around some dirt and pine needle debris that had accumulated beneath the tree, just in case there were any bones or whatnot. I didn't see anything, but I did find a plastic cap of some kind, about the size of a silver dollar. I asked Scott if he knew what it was, but he had no clue, so we put it back on the ground. Nevertheless, we kind of had the creeps and our imaginations began to run wild. How in the hell did those clothes get up there? And even more so, why? Did a storm blow them up there? Did something bad happen to somebody out here? It wasn't visible from the trail, and you could easily miss it just walking by it. We decided it was time to end our little adventure and head back, and so we did. The weather began to turn for the worse as we descended back to the trailhead, and by the time we reached the car, the winds had picked up to about 15 to 25 miles per hour. And not a single patch of the blue sky remained. 
Crazy timing, we told ourselves. As soon as we could, we notified park officials and gave them all the details we could remember about our strange discovery. They thanked us, and that was pretty much it. We tried following up with an inquiry, but never got any answers on whether or not those clothes had any significance. So we began doing our own research a short time thereafter, and what we found was quite disturbing. In 1999, the internet was still kind of in its infancy, but we were able to dig up some recent news and information about the park. Just five months previously on July 5th of that year, a 34-year-old hiker vanished in the park while birdwatching, and despite a large and intensive search, they never found a single trace of him. His name was Joe Wood, and he was a New York-based writer and author who traveled to the park to kill some time before a seminar the following day. One thing stood out about our research. Joe was birdwatching, which means he probably carried a pair of binoculars. That small plastic cap we found beneath that tree just might have been the lens cap or something of that nature. I understand that Mount Rainier draws in thousands of people each year, and that people will often litter, lose, or leave their stuff behind for park officials to clean up. But one can't help but wonder if those items we found in that tree belong to Joe himself. And again, how in the devil did those items get up in that tree? This strange experience continues to bother my brother and I to this day. This story comes to us from Jacqueline in Colorado. It was the winter of 2013, and I was on my way home from a business trip with the company I work for. I still had a long day's drive ahead of me, and the weather conditions were only getting worse. So I decided to drop anchor and get a hotel room in a remote area just 30 miles southwest of Colorado County. By this point, the sun was already below the horizon and a mountain of storm clouds were brewing off in the distance. I know, not a very wise time to travel, given the time of year, but I had bills to pay. I found lodging at a place called the Brook Forest Inn, just outside of Evergreen. When I arrived, I was pretty much the only one there. I secured a room, grabbed my luggage, and cranked up the heater once I got inside, taking my sweet time defrosting and getting the feeling back in my hands and ears. The room was very old-fashioned, almost Victorian in appearance. It had a nice queen-sized bed, a two-seater sofa, and solid oak furnishings. It was very quaint and elegantly decorated and only $85 a night, too. It didn't take long for me to settle in once I showered and crawled into my night clothes. I climbed into bed, switched off the lamp, and, and listened to the storm raging outside. I was asleep moments later. I wasn't sure how long I'd been asleep before being awoken by the sound of rattling on the front door. By this point, the wind was only getting louder and howling throughout the building, occasionally shaking it, and when I switched on the table lamp, it flickered on and off. The storm was worse than the weather forecast had called for. The door continued to rattle and I began to wonder if I had closed it all the way when I came in that night. As I got up to check it, it stopped rattling. I moved over to the window, brushed aside the curtain, and looked outside. There was a full-on blizzard out there, and hardly any visibility. The porch light was virtually lost in the darkness of it all. 
I told myself that if this storm didn't let up by morning, I might be stuck here another night or so. I checked the door and the lock, and everything was secured. I waited a few more minutes, and then went back to bed. Just before I could nod off, I heard the door rattling again, and when I turned on the lamp, I noticed something I hadn't noticed before. The door handle was shaking and turning slowly like somebody was trying to get inside. Immediately I jumped up and scrambled over to the window to look outside, and as I did, the shaking stopped again. And when I looked down at the snow in front of the door, there were long skinny footprints, about a foot in length and just a few inches wide. But there was something odd about the way they looked. They weren't boot prints or even paw prints. They were a skewed hourglass shape, something I had never seen before. Whatever made those prints must have been extremely quick because in the short time it took me to make it over to the window from the bed to the time the doorknob stopped moving, it was completely out of sight. The prince led away from the front door and out into the blizzard toward the nearby wilderness. Now what kind of animal would do such a thing in such a powerful storm, let alone try to get inside a building? Even stranger, it went directly to my room rather than any of the empty ones on my side. I was completely creeped out by this, so I phoned the front desk to voice my concern. I couldn't get through at all. When I eventually did a few minutes later, it went directly to the voicemail. I went over to the nightstand and grabbed my pepper spray then went back to the window and waited there with the lights off for the remainder of the night and into the wee hours of the morning. I didn't get a lick of sleep that night, and when the blizzard let up the next morning, I was on the road and out of the area in no time. Later on, I did a little research on the inn. It was built in the early 1900s and has quite an interesting history including a lot of paranormal experiences that people have had over the years. I don't know what it was that was trying to get in my room that night, but it wasn't normal. I'd be curious if anyone else out there has had the same experience at that inn. Interestingly enough, I also learned that the Brook Forest Inn is no longer open for business and is permanently closed. That's my story. Thanks for letting me share it. This next story comes to us from Leroy in South Dakota. Last February, my buddy and I were hired to do some investigative work on a long stretch of prairie land just east of Rapid City, South Dakota. The plot of land was around 600 acres in size, and the owner hired us to look into some missing cattle that had vanished over the course of a few days' time. Every morning, he would release his herd of about 60 cattle to wander the ranch and graze and they always returned that evening. The first night he counted the herd and noticed that one had not returned. On the second night, two more were missing, and by night three, he was down to 52 cattle out of 60. It wasn't uncommon for one to go missing every once in a while due to sickness or death, but to lose eight healthy, full-grown cows in a span of only three days was quite alarming and something had to be done quickly. The owner did attempt to locate them, but failed to find any sign of them, even with the help from his dogs. We knew the owner and had done some ranch work for him previously, but nothing like this. 
but we were determined to get some answers and help the guy out. Now, a little about the property. The land's been under the family's name for three generations now, and is surrounded by protected government prairie land, with no roads or public access. It is completely private, sectioned off by miles of barbed wire fencing, and nobody was getting in there, and the cattle sure as hell weren't getting out. The land was mostly prairie, but there was also sections of rocky and uneven terrain. We found that horseback was the most efficient means of travel from one end of the property to the other. It wasn't always cattle land, though. Before the family took over the land in the early 1900s, it was owned by a wealthy businessman who built a private religious school at the far end of the property. It was a two-story building with more than a dozen classrooms and made entirely out of brick. At one point, there were more than 150 students there, but the school closed down after only a couple decades, and by the 1930s, it was boarded up and left to the hands of time. Apparently, the building was still standing, or at least it was when the owner last saw it 15 years previously. It was located on a part of the property that hadn't been searched yet, so that's where my buddy and I came in. So one morning we saddled up and set off into the semi-winter wasteland. The weather was fairly mild for that time of year, cold and windy, but otherwise a crystal clear blue sky above our heads. There was still some light snow from the previous winter storm, but most of it had already melted away by this point. We rode off into the property with a pack full of food and water and a rifle in each of our saddles, just in case we came across any aggressive wildlife. It wasn't uncommon to spot big cats, coyotes, and even the occasional black bear. But most of the time, they never bothered the cattle. But it was winter, and sometimes certain animals tend to do more hunting, and food can often be scarce this time of year. We followed the grazing patterns to about 150 acres from the barn, and that's where our search officially began. The cattle didn't venture beyond this point very far, but we did notice something odd. Normally, cattle tend to move in a uniform formation when in herds, and their hoof prints demonstrated this. That was until we went further beyond that point. The cattle tracks were scattered all over the place, like they had been frightened or chased by something. Well, we continued on, and about 300 acres into the property, my buddy stopped and directed my attention to a point slightly left of us and far off into the distance. I watched him staring ahead with his binoculars before he handed them over to me, pointing ahead with his finger. Then I saw it. It was fuzzy, but I saw a dark figure running and disappear over a ridge about 50 yards ahead of us. It was fast, really fast. I only had a three second visual, but was able to determine that it stood upright like a man. But what kind of two-legged creature could dart across a horizon like that? We followed in pursuit, and a moment later, we reached the spot where we last saw it, but somehow we lost sight of it. Directly ahead of us, we could make out an outline of a large building. It was that old school. Our senses were telling us to go investigate it. Perhaps someone had taken up residency in there. Maybe the cattle migrated over there too for whatever reasons. It took us about 30 minutes to arrive at the building, and hadn't realized how massive it actually was until we were standing just beneath it. The building was weathered, but everything was still boarded up, and in one piece. Not surprising considering how tough brick can be over the years. We called out a couple times to announce our presence, and to warn any intruders that we were armed but we were met with silence only. 
So we dismounted our horses, tied them to a nearby rock, grabbed our guns and walked over to the main entrance. Each of us peered up at the windows, just in case someone might be looking out, but they were all shuttered. We climbed up the front steps and saw that the front doors were slightly open. The large chain that had bonded both doors together was now resting on the front steps. It didn't take a genius to figure out that somebody had broken in at some point. I was the first to go inside and was met with complete darkness and the sound of wind groaning throughout the building. My buddy followed me in and we both used our mag lights to slice our way through that darkness and through the interior of that first floor. Other than a few old desks, it was completely empty in there and everything was covered in a fine layer of dust. It didn't take long for us to notice a flurry of tracks going up and down the hallway. They went in and out of some of the classrooms and we followed them to the main stairwell that led up to the second story. Both my buddy and I were completely perplexed as to what type of tracks they could have been. About a foot long and about a half a foot wide, but didn't show the characteristics of a typical wild animal, but more like the outline of a large arrowhead. When we began climbing the stairwell, we noticed some crunching beneath our feet. And when we went down to examine the dust, there were tiny pieces of bone mixed in with it. Some of the pieces were a few inches long, others were no bigger than a quarter in size, and there were lots of them. The further up the stairs we went, the more bones there seemed to be. It was clear something was dragging their prey up these stairs and eating them, possibly to get out of the elements but it was the tracks that threw us off, and then came the stench of death. When we reached the first landing in the stairwell, my buddy used his gun to poke a larger object on the ground. I remember him swearing under his breath before reaching down and picking up a single hoof. You gotta be kidding me, he said. We both knew exactly what kind of hoof it was, too. It belonged to one of the missing cattle. This gave us chills, because whatever took them not only chewed them up into little pieces, but must have been strong enough to snatch them far away from the herd and out into this building. It would have been a monumental effort to do this with a 2,000 pound animal, let alone eight of them in a three day span. We slowed our pace while climbing those last steps, and when we reached the top, the whole upper floor was littered with cattle bones and the stench of death. Not only did we find more hooves, but also skull fragments with patches of skin still stuck to them. They were definitely the missing cattle. Good thing we had a camera with us because the owner wouldn't have believed what we were looking at. As we continued to take in the horror, a loud boom echoed from downstairs. We looked at each other, and without a single word, started back down the steps, guns leading the way. The boom turned into shuffling, and then into silence. This wasn't the wind. Something was definitely down there. About that time, we reached the bottom, and then heard the horses neighing in distress. We had left them tied to a large rock just a few feet from the front entrance. So we scrambled out there and down the hallway toward the exit. The front door was still swinging back and forth as if something had just jolted out of the building. When we got outside, one of the horses was gone. We couldn't believe it. We both split up immediately and checked each side of the building and then met around the back. We looked everywhere and in every which direction, but nothing. How could that horse have disappeared so quickly? And even if she did get loose and run off, we had a straight line of sight for miles in every direction, and we would have seen or heard her galloping away. We were both left scratching our heads, and our fingers were heavy on that trigger, 
ready to take out whatever creature was responsible for the slaughter. And now a missing horse. My buddy and I didn't waste any more time. The two of us got back on the other horse and got the hell out of there. Let's just say that we had a whole lot of explaining to do and we weren't looking forward to it. The entire way back we kept our eyes peeled, looking for any sign of that poor horse or that strange creature we saw on our way out there. We arrived back at the owner's home and broke the news to him. He was absolutely perplexed as we were. We also showed him the pictures. He contacted the local sheriff. Last I heard, they were investigating the matter. Even a year after this bizarre experience, we are no closer to the truth and the owner has taken extra measures to protect his remaining cattle. Thanks for letting me share my strange experience with you. And there you have it. I hope you found these strange stories as interesting as I did. If there is anything we can learn from them, it's that, well, I guess unless we experience it ourselves, it's all just hearsay. But still, they're pretty unnerving to say the least. Thanks for listening, and you'll hear from me before too long. Good night.